alive. Oh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. I watched every Universal monster movie, and I had nowhere to put my thoughts. So, so now I'm giving them to you. I had never watched the Universal monster movies before, you know, the classic ones, and so I decided I was going to watch all of them from Dracula in 1931 to House of Dracula in 1945. Now this was the initial run of the monster movies from Universal, and it's the one that is best known today as the classic monster films. In this collection there are 21 movies, including monsters such as Frankenstein's monster, Dracula, the mummy, the wolfman, the invisible man. The Mummy. One of the most interesting things about watching these films in a modern lens is how it was really the first cinematic universe. In a time where the MCU and the DCU have all of the studios scrambling to create some sort of cinematic universe, it's really interesting to look at what could really be the first one and notice some of the parallels between the first one and the mistakes that people make now. And since there's so many movies, I made it a little bit more simple by breaking down the 21 movies into four phases kind of like the MCU. Phase one, introducing the monsters. In 1931, Universal released its first horror movie with sound, Dracula, starring Bela Lugosi as Count Dracula himself. Now, Bela Lugosi is a name that we are going to be bringing up a lot. The movie is based on the Broadway play of Dracula, not the original novel by Bram Stoker. And this is very fitting because Bela Lugosi played Dracula on Broadway. The film is considered iconic today because of the direction and the imagery, especially for the time. I mean, the movie is dated for sure, but it came out 90 years ago, so that's to be expected. But it's not goofy and silly. It is a horror movie. My entire life, these characters and movies have been remade and paradised to the point where I never thought they were to be taken seriously. But watching this movie made me super excited to see the rest because they're not goofy and silly. These are really good movies. Dracula released and it doubled its budget in the box office in its opening weekend alone. The story of a vampire who terrorizes a town and falls in love with a beautiful woman. And at the end of the movie, he dies. What's not to love? The same year, 1931, Universal released its follow-up to its very successful Dracula film, Frankenstein. Once again, the film was based off of the stage play of Frankenstein, not the original novel by Mary Shelley. And they wanted to utilize the star power that Dracula had created by casting Bela Lugosi as Frankenstein's monster. The only issue is that Lugosi didn't want to be the monster. He was a star, damn it. He said that the role of the monster was fit for a half-wit extra. He wanted to play Dr. Frankenstein, the role that actually had, you know, lines. But the studio disagreed. They wanted him to be the monster, and so he ended up not coming back for this movie. But don't worry, we will see him again. Instead, they cast an actor named Boris Karloff as the monster. Boris Karloff is another name that you're going to want to remember because he is equally, if not more, important than Bela Lugosi. An actor named Colin Clive was cast as Dr. Frankenstein. And even though we didn't get Bela Lugosi to return from Dracula into Frankenstein, we did get to see Dwight Fry, who played Renfeld in the Dracula movie and then now plays Fritz in Frankenstein. Now, Fritz is Frankenstein's assistant. I always thought this character was called Igor because of how pop culture remembers it. But Igor is a different character that we'll meet later. The director of Frankenstein is James Whale, a director who is much beloved by the horror community, and it didn't take me long to realize why. Frankenstein was awesome. Critics called it even better than Dracula. Frankenstein pulled in $1.4 million at the box office. And that was in 1931. So if you convert that to like modern day money, that's like $17 million. The movie is exciting and visually stunning. And the scene where Dr. Frankenstein screams, it's alive, is another pop culture quote that has just been done to death. But when I watched the original, like, it was awesome. It gave me goosebumps. Compared to Dracula, which was a little bit more slow paced, Frankenstein was really exciting and fun to watch. And once again, at the end of the movie, the monster dies. A plus. After two big hits in 1931, Universal released their first horror movie in 1932, 
The Mummy. The first thing that I realized when I started watching The Mummy was that Boris Karloff, who played the monster in Frankenstein, had returned to play The Mummy. You could definitely tell that Universal was trying to capitalize on the popularity that Boris Karloff got from Frankenstein, and they really were just throwing his name up there like, Boris Karloff is The Mummy! And it worked. The movie did great at the box office. However, I personally, I didn't really love it. It followed a very similar plot to Dracula, and while it had a very interesting first half, it really fell apart towards the middle. I think maybe the reason I didn't enjoy it as much as I did the first two was because it wasn't really what I was expecting. The Mummy wasn't really a monster at all. He was just some dude. I mean, a really old dude from Egyptian times, but still just a dude. But they did follow that winning formula, and they made sure that the Mummy was dead at the end. The fourth and final movie of the first phase is The Invisible Man, based on the novel by H.G. Wells. What I love about Universal with these movies is that they really want to replicate their success. In a perfect world, they would use the same cast and the same director for every single movie. Well, James Whale directed Frankenstein, and it was starring Boris Karloff, and it made a million dollars in the box office. Perhaps for this Invisible Man movie, we could get James Whale to direct and have Boris Karloff as the monster. We'll make a million at the box office. And James Whale did come back to direct, but they couldn't get Boris Karloff for the leading role. A fun thing to think about because Universal keeps wanting to just repeat the same cast and directors is that if Bella Lugosi would have just said yes to doing Frankenstein's monster, he probably would have played all four monsters in the first phase. But instead, Claude Rains is the actor who takes on the Invisible Man, and he is incredible. This movie is by far my favorite, and even after I've watched all 21 films, it's still the one that I keep thinking about. Rain's performance is of a man who is driven to insanity and just runs around invisible terrorizing people. It's awesome. In this movie, James Whale really proves that his directing of Frankenstein was not a fluke. He's a really great director. And audiences agreed it was a box office and critical success. Plus, they kept up with their winning formula, where at the end of the movie, the Invisible Man is dead. Now, looking at the four films in the first phase, Universal created four iconic monsters. It's kind of a flawless first phase. And just because I didn't personally care for The Mummy, The Mummy is still really big in pop culture, and they go on to make a ton more of them. These four movies together were truly something special, and after watching this first phase, I was hooked, and I could not wait to keep watching. Phase two, build on the foundation. Phase two starts with the first sequel, the Bride of Frankenstein. And this is a true sequel. James Whale returns to direct. Boris Karloff returns as the monster. And Colin Clive returns as Dr. Frankenstein. Even Dwight Fry returns as a different assistant. The movie takes place literally right at the end of the first movie. That's something that sequels today don't really do. It continues the story of the first movie and it is an absolute home run. People consider it James Whale's masterpiece, and critics call it one of the greatest sequels ever made. I agree completely, mostly because there's this fantastic scene where the monster just loves smoking so much. <laughs> But what about the box office? The first Frankenstein movie made a million dollars at the box office. Did the sequel make a million dollars at the box office? No. It made two million dollars at the box office. Universal's theory of same director, same cast, same money is working. And the ending stays true to the Universal formula of the monster dies at the end. This time, it was a murder-suicide, with the monster killing both himself, the new doctor who created him, and his new wife, who didn't love him. I did think it was really weird that the movie was called The Bride of Frankenstein, and then the actual bride was only in like the last three minutes of the movie, and then she gets blown up by her new husband. 
but it was a great movie and it made me super hopeful for the rest of the sequel. So their sequel to Frankenstein being a success, they decided let's make a sequel to Dracula. And so they did. And you just know that Universal was pulling out their money-making formula once again. James Well directing, Bella Lugosi as the Dracula. None of the, that didn't work out. And they didn't really have time to figure out something because they were running out of time due to the copyright running out. So they decided to just start filming something. And that something was a movie called Dracula's Daughter. Basically, the sequel is Dracula's Daughter is now the one terrorizing a town and fallen in love. The only returning cast member in this sequel is Van Helsing. In the first Dracula movie, he's the, the vampire hunter, I guess. He's the one that kills Dracula. And he's a cool character, but I wouldn't exactly say he was like the leading man of these movies. Gloria Holden plays Dracula's daughter, and she does a fantastic job playing a vampire. It's just, the movie's story is a little boring. It just didn't have the same excitement as the Frankenstein sequel did. But they did keep up their game-winning formula, and they made sure that Dracula's daughter was dead at the end of the movie. The movie tanked at the box office, and at this point, Universal was being sold off to some new owners, and the new owners didn't exactly love horror movies. And so, this was going to be the last Universal horror movie for the next three years. After a couple years away from the horror genre, Universal had done a re-release in theaters of Dracula and Frankenstein, and it made them a ton of money. So the studio decided they're gonna start back up their monster-making machine and create a new Universal monster movie. And what a better return than another Frankenstein sequel. In 1939, Son of Frankenstein premiered in theaters. This time the movie was directed by Roland V. Lee instead of James Whale. But Boris Karloff does return to play the monster. And this made me really excited that there was this level of continuity throughout these sequels because I really thought it was going to be an all new cast every single time. And speaking of returns, Bela Lugosi finally returns. He plays Igor. Igor is a criminal who has a broken neck. They tried to hang him, but it didn't work. This is very different than the Igor in current pop culture who's just the, the hunchback assistant of Dr. Frankenstein. And then they were gonna get Claude Rains, who played the Invisible Man, to play Dr. Frankenstein's son, but once again, that did not work out. The movie is not as strong of a sequel as The Bride of Frankenstein was, but it was still a great sequel. I never would have thought that the Frankenstein movies were going to be exciting and fun to watch over and over and over again, but they are. Plus, this one was a little bit longer than most of the Universal movies, coming in at an hour and a half versus just an hour. And they really used that extra time to really develop the characters and create a really fun story that was different than the first two. It really helped me become invested in the characters, especially this little kid who I think ends up being Gene Wilder's character in Young Frankenstein. The movie did well in the box office, they killed the monster at the end of the movie again, and Bela Lugosi was praised for his role as Igor. The only issue is that Karloff had a harder time with the makeup this movie, and he pretty much decided he would never return to play the monster again. The next sequel in Phase 2 is The Invisible Man Returns. Now this was the sequel that I was most excited for because the first movie is still my favorite of all the Universal Monster movies. However, James Whale did not return to direct. And Claude Rains did not return as The Invisible Man. But we did see the Universal debut of a horror legend in Vincent Price. Universal had pulled out their bag of tricks, of course. They tried to get Lugosi to play the Invisible Man or even Karloff, but neither of those worked out. And so they wanted an unknown actor, that unknown actor becoming Vincent Price. Now, before I talk about how I feel about the movie, I want to let you know that it did really, really well in the box office. The movie made almost a million dollars. The issue is that the movie is not really a horror movie. It was like a TV drama, like an episode of Matlock. It's nothing like the first movie, which was like this psychological horror. And the absolute worst thing that they could ever do is break their game-winning formula. They didn't kill the Invisible Man at the end, I think. The movie isn't bad, it's just not what I wanted it to be, and it didn't really live up to the expectations of the first one. Which brings us to our last movie of Phase 2. This movie was called The Mummy's Hand, and to be completely honest, I just don't like the mummy movies. The other monsters just have this vibe to it. Like, when you're watching a Frankenstein movie, you just really feel that you're watching a classic horror icon. 
but the mummy dies at the end, so. Now, phase two is really propped up by those really great Frankenstein movies. I mean, with those, and then the decent Dracula Invisible Man movies, and then the mummy movie. Like, this phase is nothing to scoff at. It's not as exciting and iconic as the first phase, but that's kind of to be expected. I mean, you know? The ending of this phase was really kind of lower in quality. It was kind of harder to get through. So maybe phase three will give me a punch in the gut to help me fight through the rest of these movies. Phase three, injecting new life. Phase three starts with the third installment of the Invisible Man franchise, The Invisible Woman. Now, this movie was not even a horror movie. It's a comedy. A straight up comedy. It did great in the box office and people loved it. But it was like watching an episode of I Love Lucy. It was not, it wasn't a universal horror movie. It was, it was a comedy. You can really tell that at this point Universal does not want to make horror movies. They're trying to capitalize on the success of the characters and create films that they want, like comedies and dramas. In this movie, the Invisible Woman is played by Virginia Bruce, who is very funny. The movie's a good movie, don't get me wrong, but it's not what I expected. I mean, at the end of the movie, the Invisible Woman has a baby who sometimes turns invisible. How silly. It was at this moment that I really started to doubt this collection of movies. I thought maybe I should have just stopped after phase two because Universal doesn't want to make these movies. Why should I want to watch them? I mean, it was like no one understood what made the first movie's so special. But wait, they do know what makes those movies so special. Universal reached back into their bag of tricks and they released The Wolfman. The Wolfman was directed by George Wagner. Universal brings back both Claude Rains from The Invisible Man and Bella Lugosi. The Wolfman is starring Lon Chaney Jr. And this is another really important name like Lugosi and Boris. And this movie was exactly what I needed to remember why I was watching these movies in the first place. It was an iconic horror monster movie. It was fun and exciting, just like The Bride of Frankenstein. It just had all of the great vibes that I had come to expect from these movies. Plus, Lon Chaney Jr. was fantastic in his role and the Wolfman dies at the end. No wolf babies. So Universal follows up this home run with another Frankenstein movie, The Ghost of Frankenstein. The Ghost of Frankenstein was directed by Earl C. Kenton. And now I know what you're thinking, Chase, you said that Karloff refused to ever come back as the monster, and he did. So they brought someone else in to play the monster. And they brought back our new friend from The Wolfman, Lon Chaney Jr. Lon Chaney Jr. is the monster. Bella Lugosi is back as Igor. I love it. In this movie, Dr. Frankenstein's son, Dr. Frankenstein, not to be confused with Dr. Frankenstein's other son, Dr. Frankenstein, this is his younger brother, Dr. Frankenstein. He's the one dealing with the monster and Igor. Once again, this movie was not as strong as the other sequels, but it was still a blast. And the ending really doubles down, making sure that the monster is dead, blind, and has the brain of Igor. Now, Universal is back on a hot streak. Are they gonna follow up this Frankenstein sequel with another banger? No. Instead, they decided to make another Invisible Man movie that's not a horror movie. The Invisible Agent is a spy slash action thriller movie that was just made because World War II was trying to like, you know, propaganda the draft. You know, they're like, hey man, war is awesome, bro. The Invisible Man can't get enough. <laughs> it was a huge success in the box office, like crazy successful in the box office, but it's not a horror movie, so I'm not going to talk about it. But I'm willing to forgive you, Universal. I understand there were some other circumstances for that movie. Give me another great one and I'll be right back on your side. So they put out a new mummy movie called The Mummy's Tomb. Now don't get me wrong, I was kind of really excited when I saw that Lon Chaney Jr. was going to be playing the mummy in this movie, but it was just still boring. It did not do well in the box office and it did not do well critically. I don't understand why they keep making the mummy movies. They're obviously not as successful or critically acclaimed as the Frankenstein movies or even the Dracula movies, but obviously someone's watching them because they make a bunch. And after another cold streak and they've almost lost me once again, they pull out the big guns. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. With the Mummy movies not being my thing, the Invisible Man movies not even being in the same genre, and there's not many Dracula movies coming out, 
Wolfman and Frankenstein are carrying this franchise on their backs. And this movie was an absolute blast. Lon Chaney Jr. is back as the Wolfman. Bella Lugosi is back as Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> it's both a direct sequel to the Wolfman movie and the Ghost of Frankenstein. Meaning this is the first official time that we realize that all of these movies are connected. Originally, Lon Chaney Jr. was going to play both monsters, Wolfman and Frankenstein's monster, but it was decided that that would be way too difficult for him. So they brought in Bela Lugosi, known for Dracula, uh, to play Frankenstein's monster, which if you remember to the beginning of my video, he refused to play when the first Frankenstein movie came out. But now, technically, the monster had the brain of Lugosi's character, and so I guess maybe he was okay with it, or maybe he just needed the money. The movie was really fun and exciting, a ton of fun to watch, and they did the greatest thing that they could ever do, and they made sure that both monsters were dead at the end. Just how Papa likes them. And that's the end of Phase 3. After 15 movies, we finally got to see a crossover of two of my favorite monsters, and it was really, really awesome. Like, I can only imagine if I was a kid when these movies came out, how excited I would have been. You telling me the Wolfman and Frankenstein's monster is in the same movie terrorizing people? Phase 4, the end of the line. Phase 4 starts off with a new Dracula sequel, The Son of Dracula. And guess who they brought back to play Dracula, baby? Lon Chaney Jr. <laughs> While I wasn't expecting him to play Dracula, it is really cool that up to this point he has played the Wolfman, the Monster, the Mummy, and now Dracula. All he has left is the Invisible Man. And if he plays the Invisible Man, I'll go crazy. This movie was nothing exciting. It's typically the same plot as all the Dracula movies. You know, he's terrorizing the local land. He just fall in love with bad bitches. When I started going into this movie, I thought that Dracula was going to be the leader of the pack. Like I thought he was going to be the Iron Man, the star monster that really shines bright. But that turned out to be Frankenstein. At the end of this movie, Dracula and his new bride both die, so. Cool. When I saw that the next movie in this phase was going to be another Invisible Man movie, I was like, I wonder what genre they're gonna pick. Underwater thriller? Outer space sci-fi? But they actually returned to the horror genre with The Invisible Man's Revenge. They wanted Claude Rains to return as The Invisible Man, but once again that fell through because no one wants me to be happy. Instead, John Hall plays the Invisible Man, and I am the first to say that he did an incredible job. This movie really takes it back to what it's supposed to be. It's a madman who turns invisible and just starts terrorizing people. It's awesome. The movie did great at the box office, it made me happy, and the Invisible Man dies at the end. It checked off all the boxes. Next up is The Mummy's Ghost. We've been through this. Lon Chaney Jr. returns to play the mummy. Cool. Now, I said that sarcastically, like cool, but it is kind of cool because this is the sixth time that he has played the lead monster in a Universal Monster movie. So apparently he wasn't the best to work with, Lon Chaney Jr., and at one point he like actually choked his co-star. <laughs> and then I saw it. The next movie in Phase 4. The House of Frankenstein. This is a movie where the monster meets the Wolfman, Dracula, a hunchback assistant, and a mad scientist. Boris Karloff, who played the original monster and mummy, returns in all of his glory to play a mad scientist. Lon Chaney Jr. is back as the Wolfman. The actor John Carradine from The Invisible Man is here playing Count Dracula. And a new actor plays the monster, Glenn Strange. Now this movie was supposed to have all of the Universal Monster movies in one movie. An idea which would have really been exciting. They wanted Claude Rains to return as the Invisible Man. They wanted Bela Lugosi to play Count Dracula. But it just doesn't work out that way, I guess. The movie did well in the box office and it was really fun to watch. I was a little disappointed that in a movie where you have all of these iconic characters, it was kind of boring. It wasn't as exciting as what you would have expected. I mean, this is a movie full of monsters that I have grown attached to over the past 20 movies. It just didn't do it for me. In classic Universal fashion, all of the monsters die at the end. A plus. At the very end of the movie, Frankenstein's monster and the mad scientist get swallowed up by quicksand, so that was pretty sick. Then we had another mummy movie starring Lon Chaney Jr. You know the drill, it, you know. And finally, the last movie in the collection, House of Dracula. 
The movie is a direct sequel to House of Frankenstein, even though it doesn't really explain how some of the characters came back to life. I mean, they explain how the monster came back. They were just like, yo, he fell out of this quicksand. The original idea for this movie was going to be Wolfman meets Dracula, and they were going to have Lugosi return as Dracula, but instead they got John Carradine from the last movie to come back as Dracula. And they got Glenn Strange to play the monster again. This movie was boring. We didn't see many of the monsters interact really, and about halfway through I realized why this was the last one. It no longer had that special feeling of the Bride of Frankenstein or the Wolfman. John Carradine, who played Dracula in these last two movies, summed up what happened with the Universal monster movies. Universal in the 40s was like a factory. There was little room for creative talent when it stands in the way of box office profits. And I think this is a great parallel to what is happening in the current film landscape. I mean, Martin Scorsese just made headlines the other week when he said something very similar. Cinema is devalued, demeaned, belittled from all sides. Not necessarily the business side, but certainly the art. Since the 80s, there had been a focus on numbers. It's kind of repulsive. The cost of a movie is one thing. Understand that a film costs a certain amount, they expect to get at least the amount back plus again. The emphasis is now on numbers, cost, the opening weekend, how much it made in the USA, how much it made in England, how much it made in Asia, how much it made in the entire world, how many viewers it got. I don't think it's a coincidence that this is the same reason that the Universal Monster movies lost interest in the 30s and 40s. And I think it's the same reason that people are frustrated with the current cinematic universes. We can make some money if we put all of the monsters in the same movie. Okay, yeah, well, what should, the, what should the story be? I don't care, those monsters. People want to see the monsters. <laughs> but the reason I loved watching The Invisible Man, The Bride of Frankenstein, The Wolfman was not for the monsters. It was for the stories about monsters. Watching a man who just wanted to make a breakthrough in science slowly go mad and murder a bunch of people. Watching a monster who's lonely and just wants someone that won't scream and run away when they see him only for his new bride to scream and run away when she sees him? Watching a man turn into a murderous beast at night and then wake up the next morning with all of the guilt without anything that he can do to stop it. If there's one thing I can say from watching all of the Universal Monster movies is that whether it's 1932 or it's 2022, movies are awesome. There's good ones and there's bad ones, but we should do everything we can to preserve them. I had just as much fun watching these movies as I would going to the theater now to watch movies that are coming out every week. It was fun watching movies from a totally different era, one as early as the 30s and 40s. I had to learn to watch movies in a different structure, in a time where most of our movies are two to two and a half hours long, figuring out how to watch a movie that was only an hour and 10 minutes long. It was super interesting to see which directors I liked more and which actors were better at playing certain monsters than others. I got really excited when I would recognize one of the actors from the original Dracula movie popping up in the third Frankenstein sequel. Movies have changed a ton, but the feeling that you get from watching movies has stayed the same. Now, I ranked all of the movies from my favorite to least favorite on my letterbox. So if you're interested in seeing that kind of thing, the link is in the description below. I also have a weekly podcast where my writing partner and I write a new short film every week. It's called Written By. There's a link to that in the description below. If you're interested in storytelling, filmmaking, screenwriting, or just movies in general, uh, you can go listen to that. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it.